Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Welcome to Faith Bridge. It's good to see all of you here today. Glad you've chosen to worship with us. I want to take just a moment and uh, recognize those of you who have served our country in the armed forces. Would you please stand and let us honor and thank you for your service wherever you are? Amen. In no small measure, we are able to do what we do here on a Sunday morning with no fear, no concern, complete freedom because of the sacrifices of these men and women. And to you, we say thank you very, very much. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke today, Luke chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. If you don't uh, don't have a Bible and you need one, just raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. That can be yours to keep. Please consider that our gift to you. Luke chapter 15. We're going to begin reading in verse 11. Luke 15, 11. This is the third of three parables that are found in this chapter. The first is the parable of the lost sheep. Second is the parable of the lost coin. And now we read the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's pray. Father, as we come now to this portion of the service when we look at your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. We desperately want to know truth, we need truth. 
And you've promised to impart that to us. So open our eyes and open our hearts to what you have for us today. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Well, over the last 11 years, it has been my incredibly good fortune and blessing to travel all over the world, some 300,000 miles now, leading about 41, 42 mission trips to some 14 different countries. And the best part of it all, of course, has been the opportunity that I have had to meet thousands of different people from all walks of life. I've had an opportunity to minister to the very wealthy, very powerful, and the poorest of the poor. I've listened to the stories of their lives as they've poured out to me their hearts, their joys and their triumphs, their greatest fears and pain and sorrows. Some of those stories have been absolutely fascinating to listen to, some I wish I had never heard. But in all of those travels to all of those places with all of those people, I've made two observations. I've noticed two things that are true of people all over the world. Matters not where they live, here in the USA or abroad. Doesn't matter the color of their skin, their socioeconomic status, education, whatever. Two things that can be said of everyone that I've met anyway. And first of all is everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to be, every sane person that I've ever met anyway wants to be happy. Now, when I say happy, I'm not talking about a a momentary sense of happiness, an experience of happiness. Uh, You know, my team won last night, or uh, I finally got that date that I've been hoping for. I got that raise, got that promotion. Those, Those are all good and wonderful things, and certainly they can make us happy, but that's not the kind of happy I'm talking about. The happy that I have observed that people want is something much deeper, something abiding, something that lasts. It's a sense deep inside that it's good to be alive, that it's worthwhile to be alive, that my life has meaning and purpose. There is an abiding sense of joy. I have my place in the world. I know what my place in the world is, and I feel good about it. That. That's the kind of happiness I'm talking about that I see many people desiring. In a word, you could say, um, most people want to be saved. They want to be saved from the brokenness of this world, from the emptiness of this world, from the way that living this, in this world can often leave us feeling very meaningless, without purpose, without knowing our place, and without Joy. That's the first thing I've observed. The second truth that I have observed around the world is that as much as we want this happiness, we go about looking for it in all of the wrong places and in all of the wrong ways. To be something that is so desperately desired by so many people around the world, we don't know where to find it. We can't manufacture it for ourselves. One of the many, many reasons I love this particular story of Jesus, this particular parable, is that in this story, Jesus reveals to us the pathway to happy. It's in this story that Jesus opens our eyes and helps us understand this is where lasting happiness meaning, purpose, and joy. This is where it is to be found. Now, if you've been in church for a while, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that this story has typically been referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. That's because the bulk of the story is devoted to the story of the younger son. He sort of is the the focal point, if you will, of the story. And and the older brother kind of gets second place. Nobody's really exactly sure what to do with this guy other than label him as a jerk. But I was introduced recently to a new perspective on this story that absolutely fascinated me, uh, revolutionized the way I think about this particular parable. It actually came to me third hand. Uh, In our day, the one who has articulated this new perspective uh, most clearly is a New Testament professor, late professor, 
uh, Dr. Edmund Clowney. No relation to Jadavian so far as I know, but uh, a, a very uh, brilliant, apt New Testament scholar who passed along his insights to uh, a modern-day pastor many of you have heard of, Tim Keller. And so I am eager to share with you the insights that I've learned from both Professor Clowney and from Pastor Keller. This is not just the story of the prodigal son. This is the story of the prodigal sons, two brothers. And what these two boys represent are the two most common ways that most of us go about looking for happiness. Most of humanity can be divided into one of these two camps. On the one hand, of course, you have the younger brother who represents for us a search for happiness by breaking all the rules. Forget conventions, forget norms, forget expectations. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's the way I'm going to make myself happy, by blazing my own trail. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the older brother who represents the search for happiness, not by breaking all the rules, but by keeping all of the rules. That's the way we find happy, by doing what we're supposed to. It's when we do what is expected and required of us, that's when the payoff comes. Anybody with any sense knows nothing's gonna come of that. It's by doing what we should do. That's where we're going to be happy. And as I say, almost all of humanity can be divided into one of these two camps. Granted, different seasons of our life, we jump back and forth between the two, but by and large, all of us can identify with one or the other. And as the story reveals to us, neither one of them deliver. Neither the flaunting of the rules nor the keeping of the rules, they both ultimately disappoint, but Jesus shows us a better way. First of all, he tells us the story of the younger brother, the one who's all about breaking the rules. And man, let me tell you, this guy is a pro at breaking all of the rules. It's difficult for us some 2,000 years later to feel the full impact of his disrespect for his father, but it is immense. I mean, it's, it's bad enough if someone were to behave that way today, but in that day, in that time, in that culture, the way he treated his father was absolutely outrageous. That he would ask for his part of the inheritance before his father was even dead. Essentially, he was saying, you're dead to me. I care nothing about you. I care nothing about our relationship. I just want the money. Show me the money is his perspective. And when he gets it, as if to add injury to insult, he doesn't do anything wise with it. He doesn't go and work it or invest it or try to make something of himself. No, the scriptures are clear. He goes and he squanders it in wild living. This guy was the original party animal. I'm sure he was the inspiration for the song, I Did It My Way. Because he absolutely did it his way, did whatever he wanted to, whenever he wanted to, and no one was going to tell him how to do it any differently. One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, describes this young man perfectly. Lewis writes, when the real want for heaven is present in us, we do not recognize it. Most people if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. That would be the hallmark of the rule breakers, desperately searching for something, trying to make sense of their lives in the world, but by doing it their own way and all the while failing. And sure enough, failure is the end result for this young man. As it always does, the money eventually runs out, and so do all of his good time buddies. The money runs out about the same time a famine hits, and one of the saddest verses in all of the Bible, the latter half of verse 16, no one would give him anything. He is utterly alone. Finally, Jesus says, He came to his senses. It's too bad that that's what it takes for many of us to come to our senses, to hit that rock bottom, but he does. 
and his thoughts naturally turn toward home. Now that's an improvement for sure, but it's not the answer because he knows deep down inside, his thoughts betray him. He knows deep down inside, the old saying is true, you can't go home again. It will never be the same. And he says to himself, I can't ever go back as a son. I've lost that. It's over. It's done. I burn those bridges. Maybe, just maybe, I can go back as a servant. Maybe then I can get something to eat. Can I imagine the sense of humiliation and shame and failure he must have felt as he made that journey back home? knowing all the while he would have to admit, my way was the wrong way. But he's not the only one who gets it wrong in this story, not by a long shot, because there is another brother who gets it wrong as well. And he's not wrong just because he's an unforgiving jerk to his younger brother. That's typically what's laid at his feet. It's typically what we look to to paint him as the bad guy, but there's something much bigger, much more serious going on here than just being unforgiving and unkind. No, he's looking for a happiness of his own. He's looking for the exact same thing that his younger brother is, but he's going about it in a different way, a more respectable way. No, I'm gonna play by the rules. I'm gonna do what's expected of me. I'm gonna do the right thing, and then that's where the payoff is gonna be for me because I'm doing what's right. If you read between the lines, though, you can see his motives are a complete mess. He is just as disrespectful to his father as his younger brother was. When he hears the noise and the crowd, what's going on in the dancing, he comes back and he wants to know what is going on here and outraged when he finds out, this is for your younger brother the one who went off and blew what could have been part of your estate. And now he's coming back asking for another chunk? Oh yeah, am I mad? Let me tell you. And when his father comes out to reason with him, to beg him, to plead with him, come on inside, this is a good thing. Please come to the feast. He publicly humiliates his father by castigating him, by telling him essentially what a lousy father you are. Verse 29, I've slaved for you. I've done everything you ever asked me to do and I can't even get so much as a goat. And yet this bum, this loser, this fellow that spent my money on prostitutes comes straggling back and you're killing the fattened calf. Give me a break. If the younger brother was gonna find happiness doing it my way, this older brother was looking for happiness doing it the right way. No, I'm gonna follow all the rules. Unfortunately, that way proves to be just as useless, just as worthless, just as empty as the route his younger brother took. You see, it operates on the assumption that playing by the rules has a payoff. As if this world owes us something. That just because we do what's right, we're gonna get what's right. It does not work that way. We live in a broken world. A world that is filled with sin and sadness and tragedy. It has been fundamentally changed not for the good, but for the bad. And it is foolish in the extreme for us to think that just because in our little part of the world we're doing what's right, somehow this world is gonna arrange itself to give us the payoff. It does not work that way. That is foolish. Every bit as foolish as going and squandering one's wealth. Years ago, first year of my ministry, ordained ministry, about 25 years ago, I had the opportunity to spend a weekend in the home of a man who was retiring as the CEO of one of America's largest corporations. If I were to say the name of the corporation, everyone in the room would immediately recognize it. Uh, 
FYI, that's not how I typically spend my weekends. I don't know that many high-powered CEOs, but on this particular weekend, that's where I was. And by any measure, this guy was a success. Vocationally, certainly financially, socially, he was at the top of the heap. And he had certainly played by the rules. He had done all the right things. And there was seemingly an incredible payoff in his life. I didn't see much of him that weekend, but on the last day that I was there, both of us were up early, sitting out on his front porch, having a cup of coffee, and I thought, you know, this is my chance. And I said to him, uh, hey, share some wisdom with me. You know, as a man who's just done so well in life, crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's, obviously a success, and, and now you're retiring at the top of the heap. What? pearl of wisdom would you share with me, someone who's just starting out in my chosen field? And his answer shocked me. It was brief and to the point. He said, it's simple. Those who do good, get good. Now, my mama taught me how to act in other people's homes. And among those rules is you don't challenge or argue with your host. So I didn't. But I was nevertheless shocked by what he said and found it hard to believe because some years before, this man and his wife had endured every parent's absolute worst nightmare. Their son had been killed in a tragic accident. And I sat there thinking to myself, do you really believe that? Yeah, you've got this vocational, financial success, this payoff. But wouldn't you give it all away to have that boy back? Do you really believe those who do good get good? I couldn't believe that in the face of that glaring loss, he would cling to that belief. I, I, I can't cast aspersions at this man, though, because um, I can tell you from personal experience that keeping all the rules doesn't work. Uh, for the better part of my life, I have lived as an older brother. Uh, there certainly was that season where I was sort of a horrible hybrid, uh, acting like an older brother in public, but when no one was looking, being the worst sort of younger brother, but for the most part. I've been an older brother. And I, what I came to learn was what a dangerous way that is to live life. Because as, as Keller points out, that is a very results-oriented approach to life. It's this idea that, you know, if I do good, then I should get good. If I have played by the rules, then there should be some sort of payoff. But... Life doesn't work that way. In fact, the only thing that sort of approach to life results in is an increasing bitterness and anger. Whether we can admit it or not, the bitterness and the anger is growing because life does not work out like we wanted it to. It doesn't for anybody. I had an increasing problem with my anger that I didn't want to admit and it finally took some professional counseling for me to begin to get in touch with that. And I remember the day that my counselor, Chuck was his name, ventured to say to me, uh, Dan, I, I think I've learned something about you. You're mad. I'm like, yeah, we can both agree on that one. I'm, I'm mad. He said, but I, I think you're mad at God. <laughs> No, I mean, I'm a Christian, remember? Now, you're a Christian counselor. You're like, you understand. And not only that, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pastor for crying out loud. I don't get mad at God. I work for God. <laughs> I serve God. Yeah, I, I work for God. Dang it, I, I serve God. 
and he ain't coming through for me. No, I'm, I'm playing by the rules. You're damn right, Chuck. I'm mad. I'm doing the right things. And I look around me and I see people who aren't living by the rules and they're living the American dream. The skids are greased and they're just coasting along. My life is good, but it ain't no dream. I'm busting my tail for God and I don't see him coming through all the time for me. Boom. The truth was there and could not be denied. I had that results-oriented approach that somehow I expected life ought to deliver for me because I was playing by all the rules and the only place it got me was to be bitter and angry. And that is such a dangerous place to be in this world, friends, because the devil will take that and do two things with it. Number one, he will magnify it beyond all reason. He will take every hurt, every slight, every pain, every suffering moment that we have and make it feel as though it's the end of the world and increase our sense of unmet justice. But the second thing that he'll do that is so much more dangerous is he will convince us it's all God's fault. God doesn't love you. God isn't on your side. God could care less that you're playing by the rules. He is not in your corner. We don't know how to find happy. Whether we're bound and determined to break every rule and blaze our own trail, or if we are going to do our dead level best to keep every single one of them, we're not going to find happy. But thanks be to God, Jesus has an alternative. And the alternative is this come back to the Father. Come back to the Father. When the younger son came to his senses and came home, his expectations weren't that high. But what did dad do? Did dad disown him and make him a servant as society said he should have done? No, what dad did was humble himself. Middle Eastern men don't run to their sons. He humbled himself and he ran to his son and he embraced him while he was still a long way off. And he said, come to this feast that I want to throw for you. And when his older son disrespected him and embarrassed him publicly, castigating him for his poor parenting skills and the injustice of it all, what did he do? Did he get rid of him? No. What the father did was humble himself. And the scriptures say he pleaded with him, come inside, please come to the feast, come to my table. Friends, that is the story of every one of us. That's the story of every man and every woman because each and every one of us in our own individual way have disrespected the Father. We've walked away from God either to blaze our own trail or to somehow make our own sense of justice, our own rules over here, but we've all done it. That's the story of the Bible from start to finish. In the book of Genesis, we see the first two human beings saying, no, thank you. I'll do it my own way and walking away from God. But by the time we get to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, what is that story about? It's about a feast, a party in which the father has his children come to the table and celebrate that they are all back together again. What on earth happened between Genesis and Revelation to go from rebellion and disrespect to a feast of reunion, I'll tell you what happened in the middle, the cross happened. God the Father humbled himself. He left heaven and he took on human flesh and he did whatever he had to do to bring us home. He ran to meet us, he pleaded with us, he died for us. That's called the gospel. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is that you and I separated ourselves from the source of life and of love, and there was no way we could get back, no strategy, nothing could possibly work. And so out of his infinite mercy and love, God said, no problem, I'm gonna do it for you. Come back to me. And what is it about coming back to the Father that produces happiness? Love. Love. Every person who ever broke all the rules, every person who ever kept all the rules was really just looking for one thing, to be loved. To be loved. To know that I'm not an abject failure, to know that I won't be rejected, but that I will be absolutely unconditionally loved. To know that I can get off of this treadmill of having to prove myself over and over and over. I can be loved. And when God invites us to the feast, he is inviting us to a feast of love. You don't have to show me what a rebel you are. You don't have to show me what a good boy you are. Just come to my table and I'll show you how much I love you. That's where happiness is found. In fact, that's the only place where happiness is found to be unconditionally, completely loved. Today, the Father invites us to a, a feast. You know, when Jesus instituted what we call the, the Lord's Supper, he did so for a couple of reasons. One, one was to remind us of the lengths to which he went to bring us back. But he also did it so that we would have a reminder of what is yet to come. That one day there is going to be an unbelievable feast in which we will experience the love of God in ways we never could have possibly imagined. That's why on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. That's why he took the cup and said to them, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This table is both the means and the destination of happiness. And I want you to know that everybody here is invited. Everybody. Maybe you're here today and you're hearing this for the first time. Maybe God is turning on the light and you're realizing, I have been looking in all the wrong places and it's been right here in front of me. My father loves me and he just wants me to come home and be with him. Come to this table. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Maybe you're here and you've known that truth for a long time, but you just couldn't help it. That rebellious side just finds its way out. That rule-keeping side just finds its way out. Come to the table and realize you can let those go. There's a better place where you don't have to earn anything, you don't have to prove anything. You can simply be loved. Will you pray with me? Father, the reality of the gospel strikes us as almost unbelievable. Almost too good to be true. But the great thing is, it is true and it is completely believable because you have done it. You came in space and time in the person of your son Jesus and you paid a price that we should have paid You died for us. 
and for our sins. And you conquered our greatest enemy, death. And having done all of that, you turn to us with arms open wide and invite us, come join me. Don't wear yourself out looking for happiness anywhere else. I have secured it and it is here for you. Father, I pray for those who are here today and their eyes are just being opened to this truth. Oh God, would you imprint it upon their hearts? Would you help them see the absolute truth of the gospel? And as they come to this table, I pray that their hearts would be open to your presence and what you want to do within them. And Lord, for those of us who know the gospel, who know you, but because of our sin, we go wandering, forgive us, cleanse us. And may this time at your table be for us a time of reunion and celebration and happiness that we've come back to the one who brings us love, love to spare, love in all of its fullness. And we offer this prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan, business administrator here at FaithBridge, and I'm joined by our care and bridging pastor, Dan Slagle, who just brought us a great sermon entitled Father Knows Best. Dan, thanks for being here today. Sure. Uh, you brought us a great sermon uh, on the parable of the prodigal son. So thank you for that. A question came in, uh, you know, with the younger brother, we've got a younger brother and an older brother in this story. With the younger brother, it's really to see how he got to where he went. You know, there's uh, some outward signs sure. of the sin happening in his life. Uh, but it's not always so easy to see that you're becoming the older brother. So what are some signs, some indicators that maybe you're slipping into becoming the older brother? Uh, it's a great question because um, we don't always know. And that is what makes that particular approach so dangerous. Mm. Uh, your, your conscience can pretty quickly tell you if you're acting out younger brother-ish, mm -hmm. but you can go a long, long time and, and uh, not get in touch with your older brother mm -hmm. behavior. I, I would say there are several indicators. Um, if you begin uh, having a, a judgmental attitude toward other people, mm. uh, you begin sort of categorizing folks as good and bad, acceptable and unacceptable, even if you don't do it outwardly, but just sort of mentally, you're mm -hmm. making up your mind about who's good and who's not, that, mm -hmm. that's a pretty good sign right mm -hmm. there. Uh, a couple of things that I mentioned from my own life were uh, a seed of bitterness. Mm -hmm. When you find that uh, bitter attitude beginning to well up inside mm -hmm. uh, in places where it would not ordinarily, that's a pretty good indicator. Yeah. And, uh, and anger. Mm -hmm. um, the, as Keller points out, the, the problem with the older brother approach is that it's results oriented. And you expect quid pro quo. If mm -hmm. I do this, then I should get that. Mm -hmm. Well, when that expectation is not met, opens the door for anger and bitterness sure. to come in. So I, I would say paying attention to those, those three things would be good, uh, good indicators of the state of your soul. Good. That's helpful. You mentioned Tim Keller just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned him a couple times in the sermon and also uh, Clowney. So what other resources, if, if I'm struggling with this, uh, either from the younger brother or the mm -hmm. older brother side, uh, what other resources are there out there that maybe you came across as you were studying and prepping? Well, um, specifically regarding Clowney and Keller, uh, Edmund Clowney was a New Testament professor, better part of the 20th century. He just died in 2005. Mm. Um, 
I could recommend anything that he wrote about anything. Hmm. He's just a brilliant man. He was one of Keller's professors. Oh, super well. smart guy. Cool. Uh, I've got two or three of his commentaries. Hmm. Really good stuff. And of course, Keller can never go wrong with that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, the the resource of his that I used was the Prodigal God. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so those those two would be at the top of my list. Beyond though, um, resources, written resources. Um, I think a good uh, visit to your counselor might be in order too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that was what it took for me to get in touch with my older brother. Hmm. He, he really kind of brought it to my attention. Uh, otherwise, I don't know that I would have, have figured that out on my own. Yeah, that's helpful. And, and probably just community in general, uh, the people around us yeah. tend to be able to spot things on us, just like we have a sneaky suspicion when we find something on them, which sure. happens from time to time. Well, uh, you mentioned also that you've been traveling uh, mm-hmm. around the world and you noticed you know, that everybody's looking for happiness. Uh, speaking of recent travels, I know you just got back from Lithuania, uh, a trip partnering again with ILI. Mm-hmm. Uh, why don't you just give us a little update? Uh, what's going on with ILI these days? Uh, I know we had Peter a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. but maybe come from the FaithBridge perspective if teams going out, what's happening? Yeah, so uh, I'm happy to report that FaithBridge is integrally involved in the development of leaders all all around the world. Mm. Uh, Not only our financial support of ILI, the International Leadership Institute, but the provision of excellent instructors like yourself, Mm -hmm. who traveled with me to India in July. Um, Seth Martin went with me to um, Lithuania. Uh, The thing that I'm most pleased with is the multiplication, not only of leadership, but also the multiplication of churches. Uh, Peter Pereira referenced when he was here how contributions made by FaithBridge, financial, literature, teachers, Mm -hmm. have been a significant contribution toward the planting of upwards of four to 5,000 house churches all across India. Mm -hmm. As impressive as that sounds though, compared to the lost number of people in Mm -hmm. India, it's really a drop in the the bucket. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to be done, but very pleased with what's happening there. Lithuania was an interesting place. I'd never been to that part of the world before. Mm. Um, it is a, a country that has a strange division. Half of the country are people who grew up and lived under Soviet domination. Mm. Half of the population are those who've known freedom. Wow. And uh, the two don't always mix. Yeah. And so it was uh, an interesting cultural experience to be there in the midst of that. Mm. But the young people that Seth and I worked with are uh, really on fire for Jesus, excited mm. about the prospects of sharing the gospel in their country and seeing the church grow. And I'm just thrilled that Faith Bridge is the kind of church that cares about those things. Yeah, uh, you're right. It's fun going overseas and seeing how alive these people are and how hungry they are to share the gospel with others. It's really challenging. Uh, coming back here where we can get somewhat apathetic and just yeah. flat out lazy at times. And, and that's really the emphasis we've been talking about recently is, uh, you know, wanting to go after the one and wanting to, to be seeking the lost, uh, which is just amazing. So awesome. Well, Dan, thank you for the great message you today did. and being here. And, and thank you for tuning in to Postscript. We'll see you back next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.